So we're talking about uh, we're we're talking about Paul's missionary journeys in this class, and and the design of it is just to give kind of a, a bird's eye overview of the of the journey, not to get in depth. Um, uh, at, at some to- at, at some point, that might be fun to do. Uh, just do an in-depth study of just the journeys, and uh, I've mentioned a couple times that I, I think you could take each journey and spend, uh, you know, 10, 12, 13 weeks just on each journey, maybe more than that, uh, have a, have its own quarter study, as it were, because there's just so much to study here. But we're just trying to give an overview, capture, okay, what, what do we know uh, about these journeys, and how can we take them and, and learn about them, uh, be better Bible students, and then what applications are there uh, for us to make? So here we are on Paul's second missionary journey. And uh, the things that we, we mentioned last week and just an overview, uh, and that is that I think it's helpful to memorize and to know um, when the journey started and when they stopped as far as uh, uh, Bible uh, passages go. It's just, it's helpful to me to, to know those things uh, because uh, uh, when, when I hear somebody else teaching or preaching, uh, I, you know, if they say turn to Acts chapter such and such, you know, if it's in, the Paul, in Paul's missionary journeys, I just like to know, okay, that's on Paul's first journey. That's on Paul's second journey. Uh, and so I think it's helpful to memorize when they began, when they ended. Memorize the cities where they began and ended. And with the first two, it's real easy. Uh, they both start and stop in Antioch of Syria. Uh, and the third one's the only one that's different uh, from those. But uh, just some an overview of the of the uh, uh, of the journey. Uh, approximate dates about 50 to 53 A.D. Uh, about 2,800 miles traveled. This is about twice as many miles as the first journey. His uh, constant companions. Uh, on this journey were Silas and Luke and Timothy, and uh, this is the first time that the gospel that that Paul takes the gospel into Europe. Not the first time it's there, but the first time Paul is able to take it uh, into Europe. and uh, And I think it's helpful to just have a good I- idea of Bible geography. And so Paul's missionary journeys are a great time to learn Bible geography, to trace those journeys, and to see where those cities are. Uh, and it's on this journey uh, that Paul writes the first two of, uh, of the New Testament books we have written by Paul. The first two of those were written on, uh, his, on this journey while he was in the city of Corinth and writes the books of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. So just some, some general overview information. We talked about this last week, and so that's why I'm just kind of rapidly moving through this to get to where we, uh, to get to where we were last week. These were, the, uh, these were the points that we looked at last week in regard to some of the details uh, about this journey. It begins in chapter 15 and verse 36 when uh, Paul says to Barnabas, uh, it's time to go on another journey. And so uh, Paul Paul is ready to go and he's ready to take Barnabas with him. Uh, and of course, we know that uh, they did not see eye to eye on taking John Mark with them. Uh, and so uh, they separated and went on two different journeys. And so now twice as much work is being done uh, for the Lord on two different journeys uh, and uh, two different teams that go out on these journeys and are, and are spreading the word. But what Paul wanted to do first, and I, and I find this interesting and encouraging, is that what Paul wanted to do first was go and strengthen those new, those new converts those who had just recently been baptized into Christ, he wanted to go to them first and to strengthen them. And, and when I was reading over this again today, uh, a, word, uh, a word jumped out at me in chapter 15 and verse 36. When Paul goes to Barnabas to talk to him about this, Paul says, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city. Paul wasn't just saying, hey, let's, let's go find some, some folks that we've seen before. Paul was, there's an eagerness in that word, every. He says, Barnabas, let's go see everybody that we've converted. Let's go back to every city we've been to. And so in Paul's mind, without exception, they all need to be encouraged. Uh, and so we know they separate. And, and so on this journey, Paul, Paul begins this journey by, uh, by going north. Uh, and you can see that on this map, Antioch over on the far right with the star where he starts. And what he does is he starts by going north on this map. Uh, on the first missionary journey, he headed west from Seleucia and uh, sailed to Cyprus. But now he starts this journey and we made it up to Troas last week. And so we were on the land portion of this journey last week. But he goes north uh, from Antioch and he starts by going through some areas where he had already preached the gospel. Uh, and, he, and he does so to encourage the Christians who are there. He picks up Timothy. 
in, uh, in the city of Lystra. In the beginning of chapter 16, he, hears, he sees the Macedonian vision, receives what we call the Macedonian call uh, in chapter 16, where a man appears to him in verse 9 and says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And uh, what, a, what, a, uh, what a encouraging message that was for Paul to receive because he had been prevented from going into other, other areas. God, through his providence, was preparing Paul to go to Macedonia to preach the gospel there. And so while they are in Troas, the pronouns change from they to we. And the, uh, the great physician Luke is writing this book and so when it changes from they to we, when Paul is in Troas, we realize that Luke was in Troas. Luke joins Paul's uh, traveling team while they are in Troas. And so in verse 10, he says, we sought to go to Macedonia. So now both Timothy and Luke have joined Paul and Silas uh, on this journey. And that's about as far as we made it last week. We got to Troas last week, uh, but we did not uh, journey with Paul once he got in the ship in verse 11. And so that's what I want us to do tonight is to pick up and, and see where Paul goes from here, how Paul gets on a ship in verse 11, and uh, he starts sailing to go to the city of Philippi. And uh, Philippi, again, when, when you think about Bible geography, uh, you know, sometimes we're not very good with Bible geography, but I want you to look on this map up at the very top, the very top center of this map and on the very top center of this map, just to the left of center, you'll see in, in all capital letters, Macedonia. Macedonia is that northern uh, region of the Grecian Peninsula that is, uh, uh, that's, that's a region, like we would think of a county uh, in, in, our, in our terminology, or even a state, but although it's, it would be a small state. Uh, but uh, it, it's like a state where there are cities uh, with, within the state there. And so Macedonia is like a state or a region. Uh, and so the Macedonian call comes from, comes from a region, and where Paul goes first, uh, we, he, he passes Th Samothrace there at the very top of that island. He arrives at the port city of Neapolis, uh, and then he travels north to Philippi, which uh, chapter 16 and verse 12 describes as the foremost city of Macedonia. This was the leading city uh, in, uh, in Macedonia, it was, it was a colony described here, probably a place where uh, some retired Roman soldiers had gone. Uh, some veteran soldiers were living there uh, in the city of Philippi. And so that's where Paul goes first. And when he arrives in Philippi, um, there does not appear to be a, uh, a synagogue as uh, his, his, what we're going to see in just a moment is, is his pattern, his his custom was to go to the synagogue first, but there doesn't appear to be a synagogue in Philippi, and so he goes down by the river, and uh, he finds some women who are there praying, and he has the opportunity to preach the gospel in Philippi. He has the opportunity to preach the gospel first to a group of women, and we know what happens in Acts chapter 16, verses 14 and 15, that there is a lady there from Thyatira. Her name is Lydia, and the Bible says that she listened to what Paul preached and she was ready to heed, verse 14 says, ready to obey the things that were spoken to her by Paul. And verse 15 says that she and her household were baptized. And here are the very first converts that Paul has on the continent of Europe. The Macedonian call. Verse, chapter 16, verse 9 says, there, there was a man of Macedonia that stood and pleaded, come over here and help us. And it was a man pleading. And when Paul gets to Philippi, the first person he meets to be able to teach the gospel to, and the first convert that is there is a woman uh, and her household. And they become, uh, in, in some way, kind of the, the beginning of the church in Philippi, the backbone of the church in Philippi. Uh, we don't know uh, if, I guess she continued to remain there because she had a house there uh, mentioned in verse 15 where she says, come to my house and stay there. It's mentioned again in verse 40 where they went to Lydia's house and uh, entered her house and stayed with her there. Uh, and so we, we see, uh, we see in, in my, my, my estimation, an exciting time. When Paul gets to Philippi, he gets to preach the gospel. And as far as we know, the very first people he preaches the gospel to there's somebody who's baptized into Christ. Uh, 
and uh, how, how thrilling that must have been for Paul to, uh, to meet this lady whose heart was genuine and was searching for truth, and he gets to baptize her into Christ. And right then, the Lord adds her to the church, and the church starts in the city of Philippi on that day. That church is established. And so Paul stays there some days. If you look in verse 12, he says that he was staying there in that city for some days. Uh, if you look down in verse 18, uh, it says that, uh, that, they, they, she, uh, that they were there for many days. So apparently he stayed in Philippi for a while. And uh, we won't take time to look at the, the whole story about the little slave girl, uh, but Paul cast a demon out of this slave girl, which, uh, which made her happy, but did not, she was, didn't make her owners, her masters, very happy. Uh, and so I want you to think about what happens to Paul. He, he, is, he had to have been on a spiritual high with having taught Lydia and her family the gospel, and, they, and they're baptized into Christ, and then they're very, there for many days, and this slave girl just follows them over and over for many days, verse 18 says, and, and she's saying, hey, the, these men are preaching, these men are teaching us about the way of salvation, uh, and, uh, but you know, they, Paul doesn't want the demons testifying about what he's doing, casts the demons out of this girl, but the masters get angry with him, and so I want you to think about what happens to Paul. If you've got your, if you've got this this uh, overview sheet of uh, of the of the missionary journeys, one of the columns that we have on this sheet uh, lists the recorded persecutions in each of uh, on each of the missionary journeys. And on this particular one, the first thing that's listed up here, uh, maybe I can put it closer to the camera if if you're looking at it and don't have it at home. First thing that's listed here, this first persecution. Think about this: Paul and Silas were seized, dragged charged uh, with a crime, stripped of their clothing, beaten and imprisoned and fastened into stocks in the city of Philippi. So Paul goes from what had to have been a spiritual high to all of a sudden, he's, he's being tormented and persecuted. And, and, and for what? For casting a demon out of a girl. And they take him and they beat him Chapter 16 and verse 22 says that, he, that uh, he was beaten with rods. We don't know how many stripes were received. We know the Jews would not, they, they would stop at 39, uh, but, but these weren't Jews. These were Romans. And so Paul and Silas were beaten with rods. They're thrown into the inner prison. Their, their feet are fastened into stocks. And in our minds, this is our minds, Paul went from a spiritual high and it just kind of tanked from there. That's our minds. That, oh, all of this bad stuff is happening to Paul. But I want you to see what happens with Paul. Because while he's beaten, in verse 22 with rods, many stripes, verse 23 it says, uh, they commanded the jailer to keep him securely, verse 23 says. He put them in the inner prison, in verse 24, fastened their feet in stocks. But I like the first word in verse 25. All of that bad stuff happens to Paul, but the first word in verse 25 says, but. That means whatever happens before verse 25 doesn't matter. That's what the word but means. Here's something completely different, and in contrast, the Bible says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Through the grace of God, through the goodness of God, Paul was able to find peace and even find joy in the middle of all of these trials that he was going through. Now, that is a lesson for us to learn, that even in all that he, was, that he endured, and we, were, we are not going to see those kind of trials and persecutions in all likelihood in our lives today, but Paul did, and, and while he could have focused on all of those things, verse 25 says, but he didn't. He's singing and he's praying to God. You, he could only do that. He, he, he wasn't doing that be, because he was commanded and he had to do it. He was doing it because that's where his heart was, singing to his God. He was a man full of peace and joy, being able to serve his God. And what, what comes about as a result of that? Well, the great miracle of the earthquake and, and, and the chains falling off, and, but he has the opportunity to preach the gospel again. So here's all of these things that are happening to him, these bad things that happen. And you might say, oh, no, you know, this, this is horrible. But what, what's the result? He gets to preach the gospel again. And now 
he gets to preach to a jailer. Now, the, the Lydia may have been a Jew or, or maybe a proselyte to Judaism, perhaps, but, but she was of the Jewish faith. Here's the jailer, definitely not of the Jewish faith. Here's, here is certainly a Gentile. Doesn't know about Christ. Doesn't know about, doesn't know about all that. And Paul gets to preach to him. And when Paul has the opportunity to preach to this jailer, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the jailer and his family were converted. But I want you to think about what caused them to be converted. Certainly they were converted because of what they were taught. But they were only listening to what they were taught because of what they first saw in Paul's faith. The jailer first saw the faith of Paul, probably when he was being beaten. The jailer first saw the faith, the faith of Saul. Perhaps he too heard them singing and praying. The jailer saw the faith of Saul, and so when he knew who to go fall down in front of in verse 30 and say, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so here's a man who was converted. He's converted because of the teaching of Christ. There's no doubt about that. But the teaching of Christ had an impact on him because he first saw this lived out in the life of Paul. What a lesson for us that while we have a responsibility to go and teach the gospel to others, they first need to see that faith being lived out in our own lives. But I want you to think about this story about this conversion. Why does the Bible tell us in chapter 16 and verse 25 that it was midnight? I mean, what, 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 difference, what difference does it make that it's midnight? Why, why did God have Luke record that little uh, detail in Scripture that it was midnight when they're singing and praying? Perhaps God gives us that piece of information about what time it is to show us the urgency of the jailer's response to what Paul preached to him. Paul preached Jesus unto him. Verse 20 or verse 32 says he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who are in his house. And immediately, verse 33, he's going to wash their stripes and immediately he's going to be baptized. So the Bible says it was the same hour of the night, verse 33. So it's still the middle of the night when Paul preached to them and it's still the middle of the night when they are baptized. Now, why does the Bible tell us the time when this happened? Perhaps to show us the urgency of being baptized. Perhaps to show us the urgency and the essentiality of being baptized for the remission of their sins. If it wasn't so urgent, if it wasn't essential, then why not just wait until daybreak? Why not wait until tomorrow? Why not wait until Sunday when all the churches gathered together and everybody can see and be baptized? Why not wait until more people are, are a, a large crowd of people are ready to be baptized and, and save up the baptisms and, and, and then have them all baptized on the same day? No. Why? Because baptism is for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38 says that's what Paul preached to the jailer and he knew that in the same hour of the night. He knows he needs to go and he needs to be baptized. And so I want you to see what happens in verse 34 when the Bible summarizes what transpires. Verse 31, he is told, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 33, he washes their stripes, a, a fruit of his repentance. In verse 33, he is baptized. We see believe, we see repentance, we see being baptized. And all of that is summarized in verse 34 where it says that he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. Having believed there is a comprehensive expression that encompasses everything that he did in order to be converted to Christ. Everything that he did involved believing and repenting and being baptized. And so verse 34 is a term, having believed, says here's th this, this involves his entire obedience. It's not just faith only. That's not what this scripture is teaching at all. It is teaching that faith in the Bible, belief in the Bible, it represents a faithful obedience to the commands of God. Now I want you to think for just a moment. We, we won't dwell on this point for very long, but I, I want you to think just for a minute. We looked two weeks ago at Paul's first missionary journey, and we noted in Paul's first missionary journey, we noted the conversions that took place. And on that handout from two weeks ago, we had listed on that handout the, the conversions that took place on that first missionary journey. 
But what's interesting about the conversions that took place on that first missionary journey is that Paul, that, that, that the Bible does not say anything about anyone being baptized. Hang on a second. Doesn't mean that they weren't baptized. There's just no, there, there, it's just no, there's no, there's no specific wording that says they were baptized. But does that mean that they were not? What's interesting, you come to the second missionary journey, and what do we start reading about? We read about Lydia being baptized. We read about the jailer being baptized. We read about the Corinthians in chapter eight and verse, or verse chapter eighteen and verse eight being baptized. All of a sudden, in the second missionary journey, we're reading about people being baptized. So here's the first missionary journey, and we read about these conversions and all of these who are converted on, on this first missionary journey. But it doesn't say they were baptized. But what do we know they had to have done? We know they had to be baptized. We come to the second missionary journey, and we see, that, again, this list of conversions here. It doesn't say that all of them were baptized. We read in chapter 17 about the Thessalonians and the Bereans. We read about the Athenians being converted. But it doesn't specifically say that they were all baptized. But what do we know? We know that there is one faith. We know there is one baptism. We know there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. We know that there's only one plan that God has to save man. And what is that plan? It involves all of the same steps. So just because one conversion account doesn't list every single thing that was done doesn't mean they didn't do everything that was required. And so if you go back and read about those on Paul's first missionary journey when he comes and, uh, and like the uh, Sergius Paulus would, becomes a convert and he believed in, in chapter 13, guess what? He did the same thing that the Philippian jailer did. He believed, he repented, and he was baptized. They all did the same thing every time in order to be converted to Christ. And we're seeing that emphasized in baptism with Lydia and the jailer in chapter 16. And so as we continue with Paul on, on, this, on this second missionary journey, we, we, we won't take time to talk about his Roman citizenship, although that's, that's a good point to see and how he used his Roman citizenship in order to benefit the, the gospel of Christ, not to benefit himself personally all the time, but to benefit the gospel of Christ. But I want you to look in chapter 17. I want you to see what we're told in chapter 17 when Paul goes to the city of Thessalonica. Paul had a custom. And his custom in chapter 17, you got your Bibles? I hope you're seeing this in your Bibles. His custom was in chapter 17 and verse 2, here's the word custom, that he would go in to the sit on the Sabbaths and he would reason with them from the Scriptures, chapter 17 and verse 2. He would get into the Scriptures, the Old Testament Scriptures, and he would reason with them. So he would use a logical progression. He would, he would point out the authoritative nature of the Old Testament scriptures. He would, he would reason with them logically from them. Verse 3 says, and he would explain and demonstrate using the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus, that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead saying, here's what he would preach to these people. This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. That was Paul's custom. Wherever he went, he would preach. What's his custom? A couple things. One, he would preach to the Jews first. If there was a synagogue, he would go to the synagogue first. And so that's what he did. When he comes to Thessalonica, he goes to the synagogue first. When he goes to Berea in chapter 18 and verse 10, he goes to the synagogue first. When he goes to Athens in, uh, in chapter 18, he goes to the synagogue first. That's verse 17. Uh, and so you see that he follows his custom throughout this all the way through that he goes. But there was no synagogue in Philippi, so where did he go? He went and found the Jewish women, uh, or at least the proselytes at the very least, but the Jewish women who were praying by the riverside. So his, his custom was go to the Jews first. Why? Because they already believed in God. And he could reason with them from those Old Testament scriptures, reason with them about Jesus. Now, that's the interesting part. He wasn't just talking about Old, Test Old Testament scriptures. He was using the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. I want you to think about that. He, he's, what he does 
is he goes to those Old Testament scriptures and he says to the Jews, here are your scriptures about the Messiah. And then he would talk historically about Jesus of Nazareth, about, about what he did. So here's the Old Testament scriptures. Here's what your Bible says the Messiah would do. Here's history of what Jesus of Nazareth would do. And he would say, looky here, they match. They're the same. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah that we have been, that we have been waiting for. He would preach that to the Jews. And he'd preach that same message to the Gentiles. It didn't change. Think about that. Paul didn't change his message just because he went to a different audience. The message of Jesus Christ was the message of salvation to all men. And so he goes to Corinth, and when he writes 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, I, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his custom. Sometimes we need to think about the fact that we need to make sure that we're preaching Jesus as the Christ and not lose sight that that is the starting point. That's the foundation of all truth, that Jesus is the Christ. And the Old Testament and the New Testament together present and prove, present and prove that, that truth. Two other, well, let's, let's talk about this and then we're going to have to wrap up. I want you to see that on this journey, Paul establishes the church in every city that he went to. How did he do that? Every place that he went and baptized people into Christ, the church was established in those cities. Immediately upon their baptism, the church was established because God was adding them to the church. Everyone who was being saved, God was adding them to the church. And that's what Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says. But I also want you to see that when they were being added to the church, it was both Jews and Gentiles that were being added to these congregations. And so we see that the Jews and the Gentiles in the city of Philippi, we see Jews and Gentiles. Look in chapter 17 and verse 4, there was a great multitude of devout Greeks as well as some of the Jews who were, who were converted uh, there in, in, uh, in Thessalonica. We see it with the Bereans in, in chapter 17 and verse 12. Many of them, Jews, believed and also not a few of the Greeks. We see it um, when, uh, when he goes into Athens. We see a few converts that are listed at the end of chapter 17. Look in chapter 18 and verse 4 where it says he reasoned, that was his custom, in the synagogue, chapter 18 and verse 4, every Sabbath and he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. There, and there were not different congregations being established. There was not a, a Jewish church of Christ in the city of Corinth and a Gentile church of Christ in the city of Corinth. It was one and the same church made up of Jews and Gentiles because they learned to look beyond their differences. They, le they learned that... In Christ, we are all one, Jew and Greek. It doesn't matter who we are or where we are from. We are all one in Christ. And that's what Paul preached everywhere that he went, in every city that he went to. That Christ was the, the message of the Bible. That Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the one who died for their sins, and that he was their only hope. And when he went and preached in these cities about Jesus, look in chapter 17. We'll wrap up with this. Chapter 17, when he's preaching in Athens, the very end of his sermon in Acts chapter 17 and verse 31 says, the very last statement of his sermon in chapter 17 verse 31 says, and he has given... Christ has given assurance of this to all. God has given assurance of this to all by raising Jesus from the dead. Verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, that is what got people's attention. When you talk about Jesus being raised from the dead and the promise of all of us being raised from the dead, that is what got everybody's attention. And that's what needs to get our attention today. That's not just some little thing. Jesus being raised from the dead is the thing, is the biggest thing, is the most important thing. It's life changing. And it's a promise that we too will be raised from the dead. And Paul, everywhere he went, that's what he preached. And it changed their lives. And that same message today, it can change our life. There's just a couple points here in chapter 18. You see, 
about uh, Paul staying in Corinth for 18 months. That's just a, maybe a, a, a trivial matter. But uh, he, he stays here for a year and a half in the city of Corinth. He's teaching the, the word of God among them, verse 11 says. And it's also here in chapter 18 and verse 3. It's the only place, if, if you were to be asked, what did Paul do to, to earn a living besides preaching? What did he do before he became a preacher? We know that he was a tent maker. Well, it's chapter 18 and verse 3. Where, that's, that's where we learn that in the Bible. Just while he's here in Corinth and while he meets some new friends who are also tent makers in Aquila and Priscilla. Paul's second missionary journey, boy, 2,800 miles is uh, is a long way to travel uh, in in just two in just two 30 minute sessions. Uh, but we we've been traveling at about 2,800 miles an hour for the last two classes, and there's a lot for us to see. Um, but I hope hope you've got a taste of this journey. If I had to pick one, I might say that the second missionary journey might be my favorite. There is so much that happens on this journey, so so much excitement to see and how the Lord was working through Paul. And so that's what he did at the end of this journey. He comes back to Antioch in chapter 18 and verse 22, and he went down and spent some time with the church and no doubt did the same thing that he did at the end of his first journey, talked to them about what God had done among him, done through him among the Jews and among the Gentiles. May God help us to be thrilled by the work of God and, and through God, Paul's missionary journeys and may it encourage us, motivate us to say, I can do that. I may not need to travel 2,800 miles, but maybe just next door, maybe to people I already know who need the gospel.